So, Odin Sphere is a game that doesn't really get talked about much. And while there are some things that used to hold it back, it's gotten to the point where its lack of popularity is downright baffling to me. For those who don't know, which apparently is an unfortunate majority of you, Odin Sphere is the second in a line of games that began with Princess Crown on the Sega Saturn, and later ported to the PSP. The first of the games released under the Vanillaware banner, Odin Sphere and Grim Grimoire, were released on the PS2. Afterwards, Odin Sphere would be followed up by, let's make a Wii exclusive game with weapon degradation where up is jump because we've all suffered spontaneous synchronized strokes, aka Muramasa the Demon Blade, later ported to the PlayStation Vita as Muramasa Rebirth, which apparently got its own DLC, which if my brief glimpse of the trailers is any indication, which I'm sure is totally enough to derive all the context necessary from, have plots consisting of one that could best be summarized as the Cards Against Humanity card being relentlessly sexually harassed by a 10 year old, except this one has an axe and can turn into the Hulk apparently, and one where you play as an anthropomorphic cat. Why yes, Vanillaware is a Japanese game development studio, however did you guess? With Dragon's Crown finally entering development and being released for the PS3 and Vita later ported to the PS4 as Dragon's Crown Pro. And finally, Odin Sphere Lifrasir. Just as a note, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of that, but that's how I'm going to pronounce it going forward. So you're going to have to get used to it. When Odin Sphere first came out, there were several things working for and against it. On the plus side, you had a gorgeous looking game with multiple characters to play through an interconnected and emotional story, sublime music, and it was released for arguably the best console ever, the PlayStation 2. However, initially, there were more cons than pros to be found, at least when looking back now. For one thing, while its visuals were beautiful, this was 2007, which meant that Crisis, Bioshock, and Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction came out the same year and had varying combinations of beautiful tech and art on display. And while Odin Sphere was distinct from most everything else, its Achilles heel was its frame rate, which was serviceable most of the time, but could turn without hyperbole into a goddamn slideshow in certain fights. I'm looking at you, Odette boss fight. What's more, while the game was stunning, it was also extremely repetitive, as combat environments were not only tread time and time again, even within the same world, Characters would visit the same regions over and over again with little to no distinction. It also didn't help that, even when talking about the PlayStation 2 itself, it had to go up against a little franchise's new installment in a series known as uh, God of War. So yeah, being released the same year as arguably the absolute best game in the series didn't exactly help it either. Also, because this was 2007, the PS2 was getting pushed out of the spotlight by the industry titan's newest hardware, i.e. Nintendo's check out our GameCube with imprecise and unreliable motion controls, online functionality that would make a Dreamcast owner cringe, the same abysmal third party support, no DVD player, and a GameCube controlless console, the Wii. Sony's we're screwed right now, so we'll play the long game and work on reducing the Blu-ray player development costs and get rid of backwards compatibility if necessary to make the price point more appealing, PS3. And Microsoft's first, we're first. Buy this, buy this now, you goddamn sheep. No, we are not going to stop charging you to play games that you already paid for online. We're going to set up a hostage to, I mean, revolutionary industry standard. Our product is a reliable and sturdy piece of heart. No, that console is not on fire. It's fine. It's fine. Just buy it, damn it. Xbox 360. As a note, my Xbox 360 has a red ring of death as I'm writing and recording this. Odin Sphere's greatest hindrance, however, was arguably the gameplay, as it had several things that got in the way of the enjoyment of the game. For one thing, it's a brawler RPG hybrid, which in and of itself would not be a problem were it not for the fact that it's also score-based, but lacks finesse. Games like Devil May Cry 3 have RPG elements, but it's an action game first and foremost, and as such emphasizes control over stats. Odin Sphere, however, went in the complete opposite direction, making stats more of a focal point. As such, it was less about skill so much as it was about grinding previous areas to fortify your abilities. 
It didn't help that there was a stamina system for even the most basic attacks, and almost no distinction with regards to playstyles across all the characters save for one. Certain regions themselves were also a pain just to traverse by virtue of the environmental hazards mechanics which saw poison, extreme heat, and cold continuously damage the player over time unless they either constantly created and consumed potions or bought and equipped pricey relics beforehand, a matter that was complicated in of itself by the virtue of the currency system. However, one can't talk about gameplay foul-ups without mentioning Titania, as it featured what are easily the most annoying sets of enemies in general, with one in particular standing out. The ooze enemies were ones that weren't capable of being dealt with with your primary move set when encountering them for the first time, all but demanding that the player create and stock up on offensive potions if one was to do any significant damage. And as if that weren't bad enough, the wizard enemies were their own special kind of hell in that they required the player to stun them with their own summoned swords before being capable of doing any significant damage. It also didn't help that the game was distributed by Atlas, the publisher whose most popular games are inexplicably let's spend half the time doing things like school, working jobs, and other mind-numbing medial tasks before you can actually be allowed to have fun, the game, aka the Persona series and let's spend half the game doing needle mind-numbing tasks again! With the other half, playing sliding block puzzles while a giant monster woman tries to eat you with her butt. The game, aka Catherine. <sighs> Super Butterbuns is right behind me and judging the shit out of me, isn't she? So after Vanillaware received a much needed brain transplant following the release of Muramasa, they created a deep and varied combat system for Dragon's Crown and thought to themselves, what if we did this, minus the paper thin beat em up style story engagement and hopelessly overused western fantasy tropes? And so, after appeasing the gods of the industry with a blood sacrifice for having the audacity to do something other than re-release the exact same game with nominal improvements for a full price and call it a day, Vanillaware is set to work on creating Odin Sphere Lithrasir, a game that wouldn't just HDify the visuals, but completely rework the gameplay from the ground up. Gone was nearly every conceivable issue found in the original. The game featured a completely reworked combat system that homogenized and diversified the characters in the absolute best ways possible. When it came to the base mechanics, all the characters were given generally the same abilities. Every character could finally all glide, block, air juggle, and dodge. But when it came to specific move sets, each character had so much more at their disposal, with special attacks now being the only thing that consumed the power gauge, and basic attacks capable of being used infinitely, save for Mercedes. In the original release of the game, you could count the number of differing moves and abilities for a given character on one hand, but Lithrasir provides tons of new moves and abilities for characters to take advantage of. With so much more control and finesse to the combat, the game finally embodied everything it could have been, but as massively welcome as these changes were, they were just the tip of the iceberg when it came to the tremendous improvements to the game. Nearly every single existing enemy in the game was altered to account for the new mechanics, and their numbers were bolstered by featuring brand new enemies, with very few being mere palette swaps, including brand new mid-bosses. Regions were also given much more variety when it came to the backdrops, rather than traversing the same combat environment over and over. What's more, the need for protective gear against the environment was thankfully tossed out in favor of the occasional strong winds and key plus locked door mechanic that keeps doors open when revisiting older areas rather than having to hunt them down all over again. Leveling up with food was also made way more convenient, both with the introduction of a new character and a much needed reworking of the restaurant and currency mechanics, where previously you had to gather ingredients and the specific funds necessary to create XP boosting food items, you can now choose between one or the other, with the lore being changed to say that the currency necessary for purchasing the food is no longer used by shopkeepers. It makes things much more straightforward from a gameplay perspective. As if all of this weren't enough, the game also featured the ability to play through the original version of the game with a bunch of different modifiers to tweak the experiences to your preferences, bonus lore text, a boss rush mode, and tons of other beneficial changes that I don't even have time to list. So along came Vanillaware and Atlas, triumphantly revealing their greatest game yet, 
With all the polish and beauty one would expect from a new AAA release at two thirds the cost, made available on the PS3, PS Vita, and PS4, and with a demo provided for the PS4 version so people could try it out and play it for free anytime they want. And not a single f was given. What the hell? Now it's worth noting that the game isn't totally perfect. Mercedes isn't as fun to play as some of the other characters sometimes, since her basic attacks still deplete the power gauge, she has the fewest power attacks of all the characters, and there's an extremely unfortunate tutorial omission that would have helped players realize her full potential. Not to mention her incessantly saying no, no, no. every single time she reloaded and combat vocalizations in general could get very irritating. But aside from that, there's very little to complain about. And it's a real shame that this game doesn't get nearly as much attention as other Sony games. If this video has piqued your interest in Odin Sphere and you're looking to play the game for yourself, consider checking out some of my other Odin Sphere videos, starting with the tips and tricks one. And if you're interested in other tips for beginners and or forgotten games, consider checking out Super Butter Buns' channel, link in the description below.